we especially ask that you turn on your camera if you are asking a question of our speaker. If you are not speaking, we ask that you keep your microphone on mute to minimize any background noise. If you have any questions for our presenter, and we highly encourage you to ask, please let me know by indicating your question in the chat or by raising your hand through the toolbar. Okay, so now let's get started with a brief introduction to our, for our speaker tonight, Damian Jackson. Damian is the Assistant Dean of Student Finance at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and works with the Office of Diversity Enhancement. He is also a member of the Diversity and Inclusion Strategic Planning Committee and specializes in student financial services, enrollment management, and education administration. With that, I will turn it over to our speaker, Damian Jackson. Thanks so much, Nyla. I appreciate the invite tonight from the AMSNY, um, I guess, lecture series. Um, really happy to be with everyone this evening. Uh, should be a quick four or five hour presentation. So. Uh, <laughs> we can get through this quickly. Um, as Nyla mentioned, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about student loan forgiveness and repayment programs. Um, I've been in higher education for close to 30 years. Wow. Um, and I've been in student finance probably just as long. So this is this is something that I've been doing quite a while, and it's it's a passion of mine, uh, quite honestly. So I'm Really, really excited to be with you tonight and hear the questions if, if you have them um, as we go through. So this evening, if I can get these slides to advance, there we go. Uh, we're gonna be talking about loans, of course, but there's always a little time for mindfulness. Uh, don't let yesterday use up too much of today. It's really about being present and um, attacking what's in front of you, right? And I know a lot of times we regret doing this, regret doing that, doesn't help you uh, take care of what's in front of you. And that's that's where your, your focus should be um, and how, are you, how you spend your time. So our objectives for today, uh, to go over some terms and concepts so that we can kind of level set. Uh, then we're gonna hit the repayment plans, uh, go through our forgiveness and repayment assistance programs, uh, the proposed changes to one of the um, IDR repayment plans, which is repay. And do a little talk if we have time around consolidation versus re refinancing, and that's uh, a topic for uh, a few of my graduates this last uh, last few months. So, when we talk about basic terms and concepts, I think it's important that we understand uh, a little bit more in depth some of these things. So, the loan portfolio, uh, it's important for you to understand what's in your portfolio and what it's made up of. Uh, so, your loan portfolio was going to include your private loans, your uh, Stafford loans, your um, if you had Perkins from undergrad, if you had subsidized loans from undergrad, any institutional loans, they're all going to have varying interest rates, varying uh, repayment terms. So it's it's a good idea to understand each one of them and what you can put together and what you can't. So as far as consolidating, can you consolidate private and and federal? Can you consolidate your institutional loans and your federal loans? And what does that do to your repayment? So it's important to understand what's in your portfolio, uh, how that's going to affect your long-term plans, You know what's the best way to leverage what's in there. Um, so getting a good understanding, that's, that's a basic fundamental thing. Uh, interest capitalization, that's something we're going to talk about a few different times today. Uh, that's when interest that's been accruing you know, in the regular world before we had this kind of weird situation with zero interest, um, interest that was accruing for the time that you were in school that was not added to your principal, right? So you have principal that you borrowed, uh, interest that's accruing based on that principal. When that interest is added to the principal, that's called capitalization. And that doesn't happen normally while you're in school. It happens when you start repayment. It happens at different times during your loan repayment journey. Um, but it's an, it's a, an important term to understand because with some of the income driven repayment plans, we can talk about how do you postpone that, right? Because that interest that's being added to principal now gives you a bigger principal that's added, that's also now accruing interest, right? So that's a, a basic term for us to understand. Uh, partial financial hardship is another term that's gonna be used in our income driven repayment plans. Um, pay as you earn, for example, you have to, to show a partial financial hardship to get into pay as you earn. That's one of the repayment plans we talk about later. So that's really uh, a calculation. I can talk about it more in depth when we get to the payment plans, though. It's, it's a calculation that's based on uh, your prior tax information 
the payment that's derived from that and then comparing that to what the, the standard payment would be. So we'll get more into that. Um, I know it's probably a lot right now. Uh, consolidation, that is when you take all your federal loans and create a brand new loan with a weighted average of your interest rates, right? So consolidation and refinancing seem to be used interchangeably sometimes and they're quite different. So consolidation is really focused on your federal loans, bring them together, creating one new loan with a weighted average of interest rates, which gives you a, a whole new set of benefits that you have the opportunity to take advantage of. Refinancing is when you look outside of the federal program to get a lower interest rate and then use that, that, that bank, that entity to buy that federal debt, and then you're paying back that entity at the lower interest rate, right? So in some situations, in some casing, cases, refinancing is a better option for, for you. Um, if you're sitting at an interest rate of, unfortunately, next year, it looks like they're going to be close to 8% in some, some situations. So if you're sitting at an interest rate of 8%, and when you graduate, you have an opportunity to, to refinance for 4 or 5%, that makes sense, right? So that's when a situation where refinancing makes sense for you. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, a little bit later on. So we'll dig into the repayment plans. The three that we're going to talk about today are the income-driven ones, because the others, quite honestly, um, one, they're not eligible for public service loan forgiveness, uh, and two, they're really not viable, some of them. So standard, if you have a considerable loan debt, it's just not something you're able to pay uh, with, a, with a PGY1 salary or something like that. Um, graduated is not, those payments wouldn't count towards uh, PSLF, and that's, for some, that's the goal. Um, income contingent is just a, an older version of these repayment plans, so it's not something you should really consider. Uh, so you really should try to focus on the on these three. So IBR is the first or the granddaddy of these income-driven repayment plans. It was uh, created probably about 12 or 13 years ago. Um, and it was a novel idea to use your income to determine what your monthly payments are going to be. And helped out a lot of folks because when you have, you know, a, a lower income and you've got to make a payment of fifteen or sixteen hundred dollars a month, it's just not going to work. So it forced a lot of people into forbearances. And a forbearance is where you postpone your payment, but interest continues to accrue. So you're looking at a lot of interest accruing and people just not being able to make loan payments. So they came up with an IBR, which looks at your income, your prior year tax information to determine what your payment's going to be for the next 12 months, right? And then your payment can not be any more than 15, depending on when you um, borrowed your loan, 15% of your discretionary income. So that gave a lot of folks an opportunity to make an actual payment on their loan and not have to go into forbearance. Um, IBR is also eligible for PSLF. So after 10 years worth of payments, you can get that forgiven. It's also has built in forgiveness after 20 or 25 years, depending on which, which IBR you're in. So there are lots of different ways to utilize this particular plan to get out of debt or be able to make payments that are manageable while you're in training or fellowship or something like that. But IBR, once again, is one of the oldest ones. So probably not the one you'll be shooting for when you actually do start repayment. It's gonna be one of these two. Pay as you earn, um, which is the which is a repayment plan that I, I normally suggest when folks are thinking about PSLF. And the reason that I do that is because they have two great benefits that will help you get the biggest forgiveness. The first being that the current pay as you earn allows you to split spousal income. So as I said before, they look at your income from the prior year to determine what your payments are going to be. So if you're if you're able to separate, if you're married, if you're able to separate your spouse's income by filing married or filing separately, then you can guarantee that you'll have a lower payment. Um, the, the repayment plan I'm going to talk about next does not allow you to do that, right? So that's why this is a, a good benefit for pay as you earn. So you can split that, that spousal income, which is really going to come into play during your, your training, right? So during the years when you have the lower salary, so you can get those lower payments. A, another salary on top of that is probably going to double your payment or sometimes triple your payment. So you don't want to be in that situation. So you're, you're able to just look at your, your income by filing married filing separately. The second benefit that it, that it has that's, that's very impactful, especially for high potential uh, earners, is the, the monthly payment cap. So with pay as you earn, um, when I talked about the partial financial hardship before, it's going to come back into play here. Uh, when you're entering into pay as you earn, 
you'll have a loan debt, for example, of 200K, let's just say. And we'll say the standard payment on 200K is uh, $2,100 a month. You're not going to be able to pay that as a PUI one. It's not going to happen, right? So you decide that you're going to try to do pay as you earn. So they will, at that point, assess your income for the prior year and say, okay, Damien, based on this income, looks like you can make a payment of $10 a month. Okay, perfect. So now the other benefit that pays you earn has is that I know at that point, my monthly payments will never get above $2,100 a month because of that cap, no matter how much income I earn, right? So as an attending, I can make four or $500,000 a year and the most they'll ever require me to pay is $2,100 a month. And that's set from the very beginning. So that's, that's beneficial to folks who are looking for PSLF and high potential earners because now you're able to earn more money and not have to pay more towards your loan and get more forgiven. That's basically how those two things will work together, right? So pay as you earn, if you're thinking PSLF, is probably the best way to go um, as far as trying to get the biggest yield from the forgiveness uh, because of that monthly payment cap and then the ability to split spousal income, right? So how, how they determine your payment? The payment for pay as you earn and for repay and for IBR, so any of the income-driven repayment plans, is based, is based on the, the poverty line or poverty level. So if we're thinking about the national poverty level, so a family of one, a single person, I think is about $19,000. If you make below $19,000, you consider that you're in poverty. So the way that they, they calculate these, these payments, um, they allow you to protect 150% of the poverty line. So at 19,000, you would add another 10,000 on top of that right? Roughly. So now you're at um, $30,000. So you have $30,000 that you can protect of your income, right? Because they're only going to use, they're going to protect that. So you have a $60,000 salary, let's say. So now you have 30 minus that 60. So you have a $30,000, $30,000 of what they can assess your payment on, right? And now we said before, with pay as you earn, it's going to be 10% of that discretionary income. So now $3,000, now you're going to divide that 3,000 by 12. And that's how they determine what your monthly payment's going to be, right? So that ensures early on, especially that you're going to have a very low payment. The specific, it's especially if in your fourth year, you're, making, you're paying. So what we encourage our students to do at Einstein is file their taxes before they graduate. So in January of their last year, file your taxes based on whatever income you made last year. And most people are not making any income. So you have a zero income and you're filing that zero tax return. So they'll use that zero income to determine what your payment's going to be for the next 12 months. And guess what that's going to be? Zero, right? So you have 12 payments of zero that all count towards 120 that you need for forgiveness, right? So filing your taxes, understanding how they determine your payment are, um, understanding what partial financial hardship is because a partial financial hardship is going to be, and I talked, I talked about getting back to this, when they do calculate that payment. So let's just say their payment is $300 a month. As I mentioned before, the standard payment is $2,100 $2, a month based on the, the loan debt that you have. As long as your monthly payment that's calculated from your income is below that $2,100, you have a partial financial hardship. So that means for me, Number one, I can get into pay as you earn because pay as you earn requires you to have a partial financial hardship to get in. Number two, during that period, any interest that accrues doesn't capitalize. So we talked about capitalization before. So what capitalization is, when we take that interest that's been accruing to add it to your principal, give you a bigger principal going into the next year. While you have a partial financial hardship, you're not gonna have a capitalization event. So for people, let's just say if you have a six-year program, if you're doing three years of residency, three years of fellowship, you can have seven years where you don't have a capitalization. So all that interest is accruing, it's not being added to your principal, right? So that gives you a lot of time to consider if PSLF makes sense for you or it doesn't, um, and it not really hurts you because you can continue to make the minimum payment and your interest is accruing, but it's not being added to your principal. So if, you, if at the end of the day, you decide not to do PSLF and you want to go to private practice or something, whatever it is, you have an opportunity now to, to pay down the interest you haven't been paying before um, and it not hurts you. 
And I can dig into this a little bit further when we get to the question and answer. But the partial financial hardship is very, very important, right? Because now you get a chance to postpone that capitalization of interest. Um, the next repayment plan, repay, when you have a partial financial hardship in repay, not only does the interest not capitalize, but you get a 50% subsidy on any interest that accrues during that time. So for example, if you have $10,000 worth of interest that's gonna accrue during that time, only five, they lock off five of that for you automatically. So if you're not considering PSLF or any of the um, forgiveness programs, this is a fantastic benefit for you if you're paying it back yourself because you're paying back less than you would in any other repayment plan. So repay has that fantastic benefit. And that's the only one I would say is fantastic about repay. Uh, you don't need a partial financial hardship to get into repay. Um, anybody can get in. Uh, you cannot split spousal income at this point. So it takes into, into account household income. So regardless of how you file, even if you try to file married filing separately, they will get your spouse's income and that's gonna be part of the, the consideration for your payment. So that's gonna be a higher payment nine times out of 10. And it does not have a monthly payment cap. So that means as you earn more money as an attending or your spouse and, and you decide to file joint taxes, every year your, your um, income is gonna be assessed and your payment is gonna increase. So pay as you earn, revised pay as you earn is a great repayment plan if you're paying the loan off yourself. That's, that's probably the folks that would be leaning towards this because you get that 50% subsidy on your interest while you're not, while you have the partial financial hardship. And um, so you're paying back less. But other than that, if you're thinking forgiveness, those type of things, pay as you earn is, is, is definitely the way to go, um, in my opinion. So the, the, the pros for, for repay, definitely the 50% the subsidy. Uh, the payments as far as during training, they can mirror um, pay as you earn as long as you're not, you know, uh, married. They can mirror pay as you earn because they can be using your, your income to do that. So those things are going to be the same. The difference comes in as an attending and that monthly payment cap. Because if you don't have that cap, for example, if we're looking at pay as you earn versus repay, in repay, in pay as you earn, you know you're paying that $2,100 a month, regardless of how much income you make. So you can make a million dollars a year you're still only paying, paying that $2,100 a month. If you're in repay, it could be ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a month, right, based on that same income. So that's where the differences are gonna, are gonna lie. So good news. Uh, the White House has proposed a change to repay that will take effect in July. With that change, you can now split spousal income by filing my filing separately, right? So that helps out the folks in the early part during training separating that in income. The next thing is protecting the protecting 225% instead of 150%. So now it's close to almost $40,000 worth of income that you can protect. What that means in real world is the first year you're gonna have a zero payment because it's gonna be based on your last year you know, income, which is zero. Your PGY one year, since it starts in July, right? You're looking at probably $35,000 worth of income and I say we're, we're already protecting 40,000 so that your second year is probably gonna be a zero payment as well. Your third year, when you're up to 60 some, 60 some odd thousand dollars, you're probably looking at a payment at 80 or 90, $90 a month, right? So that is very reasonable, quite honestly, right? So it's, that's a fantastic benefit or a fantastic enhancement to this repayment plan. Um, and then there's 100% subsidy on any unpaid interest. So before it was 50, now it's going to be 100. So whatever you're not paying or you can't pay because your payment is zero or your payment's 90, whatever interest that's accruing during that time that you have a partial financial hardship, mind you, is going to be erased, right? So you go into your, into your um, attending years with just really your principal balance, quite honestly, right? So repay 2.0 is what I like to call it is a um, definitely improvement over repay, but it also does not have the monthly payment cap. So especially for a cohort like this, that monthly payment cap makes a huge difference. The shiny things that repay offers in the beginning are great, but if you're thinking uh, forgiveness, that monthly payment cap, I think is probably one of the most impactful things. So, we're into the refinancing versus consolidation conversation. And um, 
as I mentioned before, refinancing, you know, we're looking at getting a better interest rate than we currently have. And so when I see this most often when I'm doing my exit interviews are for, uh, for students who are going to go to shorter residency programs and then be making a lot of money more quickly, um, or they have, you know, relatively small loan debt. And they're like, well, it doesn't make sense for me to, to, to try to stretch this out for 10 years to get the forgiveness, or I'm not really interested in, in working in academic medicine. I want to do um, private practice, uh, but I need to understand if I can get a better interest rate. So they would look to SoFi, I'm not you know, uh, endorsing it. That's just an example of a company that does student loan refinancing. Um, so we look to a company like that to buy this federal debt and give them a better rate. And so they can come really become really aggressive at the lower interest rate, which saves you a lot of money, just depending on how low it goes. Uh, right now, with the economy being the way it is, and interest rates being where they are, um, the federal interest rates, federal student loan interest rates are actually better than what you can get out there. So this is not a great time to, to refinance. Um, I would just continue to, if, if you're in a situation now, I'll continue to look. Uh, so if it's not great this year, next year, just see what the rates are. Year after that, see what the rates are. Um, I actually do believe that when you're thinking about refinancing, even if you, look, you have a low um, loan debt or you're not thinking that PSLF is going to work, I still think you should stay in the federal program while you're in training, just in case something changes, right? And you decide that you want to be in academic medicine or you find a way to do both academic medicine and private practice. So now that you're now that you're in the federal program and you've been making the payments within that, you have qualifying payments. As soon as you refinance your payments, you cannot get PSLF because now it's a private loan and that's not eligible for PSLF. So if you're in training, I, I suggest if you can, of course, I suggest that you stay in the federal program. Once you're gonna graduate and you can make that decision, number one, you have a better better chance to get a better rate because now you have more income. Um, you're, you can, if you have an issue with your credit score, you can get a better credit score, work on your credit score while you're in, in training. Uh, you're much better vet for these uh, companies as an attending than you would be as a resident. So it just makes sense to me that you wait, see what's, what the landscape looks like. Um, make sure you continue to make eligible payments for PSLF so that you have all options on the table for you. And then if it still makes sense for you to do what you, if the plan that you've set forth makes sense, then you can go ahead and, and do the refinance. But doing it too early, I think, um, kind of bites you in the, in, um, bites you in the back. So consolidating is, as I mentioned before, um, when you combine your federal loans into one new loan, right? And the strategy around consolidating is, is really has nothing to do with um, combining your loans to make it an easier uh, loan to pay, right? Instead of paying six payments, you pay one. That's not really why you would consolidate. Um, the reason we consolidate is so that we can use the tax forms uh, from last year. So if you're a graduating student, uh, I tell my students to, to the day after graduation to consolidate their loans. Because what consolidation also does, it gets rid of your six month grace period and you start making payments as soon as possible. Right. And that's beneficial because <clears throat> if you don't, if you take take the six month grace, when you apply to get into when you apply for consolidation or when you apply to get into one of the repayment plans and you try to use the tax forms that you had from last year, right? When you have the zero income or the very low income, they'll take that. But a part of the application process is are you currently working or has anything changed since you filed those taxes? And you'd have to reply yes because you've been working for four or five months at that point with several pay stubs. They would ask for that information and you'd have to provide that as well. So instead of getting a zero payment because you had a zero income or very low income, you'd have a five or $600 payment, right? So the reason we consolidate is so we don't have to worry about the grace period and we start making payments as soon as possible and use our taxes from last year and answer the question, are you currently working? No, because I just graduated. So I'm not currently working. So they will process the application based on that tax form that you supplied. It'll take about a month for that application to process. So end of June or so, let's say, you'll have a brand new loan with a weighted average of your interest rates. And then the end of July, you have your first payment of zero. So even though you're 
paying earlier is still a zero payment. And you'll have 12 payments of zero that will, as I said before, count towards 120 that you need. So consolidating is really part of the strategy to, to maximize what you get in the forgiveness. Um, and I've had a few students who forgot what we talked about in our exit interview and have five or $600 payments because they took their six month grace and like, oh, but my classmates have a zero. How does that happen, right? It's that six month grace. So you have to try to get that consolid consolidation done right after you graduate. Um, I say day after graduation because so much is going on in everybody's life, they're gonna forget about doing it. So uh, that's why I mentioned day after graduation. So I've been mentioning uh, for forgiveness programs. Uh, that's our next, uh, next stop. Uh, so PSLF, that is the probably the catch-all at this point. Uh, it's roughly 12 years old, probably. Um, so this program is uh, 10 years worth of work at a 501c3. Does not have to be continuous. Uh, just has to be a total of 10 years worth of work um, at, while making payments in a, in a qualifying program. So IBR pays you earn repay or all qualifying repayment plans. Uh, you have to work at least 30 hours a week. Um, there is a form called the employment certification form that you have to submit. Uh, you, it's not required annually, but you can submit it annually. It is required, however, when you switch employers, right? So if you finish your training at one hospital, you go to a new hospital, you have to get another form filled out. Um, and for some students and some doctors, uh, that 30 hours a week, you can split between three different hospitals. So 10, 10, and 10, you'd have to get a form filled out in each hospital, right? Um, once you get that form filled out by HR, because that's who's going to do it for you, uh, you'll upload that form to your servicer's website. And that servicer is not Mohila. Uh, your servicing will be switched to Mohila because Mohila takes care of all accounts who are interested in public service loan forgiveness. So once that happens and your form is processed, you will see almost like a countdown clock. They will tell you you have 12 qualifying payments or you have, you know, 114 left or whatever it may be. So there's really no guessing about how many payments do I have left to forgiveness. Um, I think in the last year and a half, uh, Department of Education has done a really good job and uh, better education around the program, uh, better processing of applications. In the very beginning, it was terrible, terrible. Um, the rollout was bad. The education was bad. Everything was bad, quite honestly. Um, so the program got a bad name because of that, but it's, it's, a, it's a great program. I think they've done a much better job lately of, of making it an efficient process. Uh, it's always been a great program though. Um, the NIH loan repayment programs, this is really focused on folks who are thinking about uh, doing more research. Uh, NIH has two programs, one's intramural, but actually working at the NIH, and the other one's extramural. Uh, the extramural program, you have to be doing research on, you know, pediatric research or uh, clinical research, uh, research in health disparities. Uh, they have a program called Research in Emerging Areas of Critical Human Health. Uh, so those are the programs that you can, do, you can do research in if you're doing it extramurally. So if you're doing it at your university or your hospital and not at the NIH. Um, in order to qualify, your debt has to be equal to or greater than 20% of your annual base salary. Right, so you can't say I have five thousand dollars worth of loans and, and get an NIH loan repayment. It's just not gonna not gonna happen. Um, the fifty thousand dollars that they give you, and it's a two year award, um, total of a hundred thousand. The fifty thousand that you get, uh, they actually help you pay any taxes that are affiliated with that or associated with that, which is great. So it's essentially tax free. Um, but folks who are really interested in, in research, this is, a, this is a great benefit. I've had a, a few graduates who have uh, utilized this program to, to help pay off the loans. And the thing about this, too, is you can double dip. So it's not something where you can either do PSLF or NIA. You can do both, right? And for many of these programs, you can do both. So um, it's an, that's an important distinction because there's, there are some programs, unfortunately, where they say that you can't do two programs together. But this one, definitely, you can do both. Um, something more local is our Docs Across New York program, which is $120,000, and you have to give a three-year uh, service, three service obligation. Uh, this can be used for both uh, debt and for opening up a practice. 
um, you know, working shortage areas, of course, underserved areas, uh, all specialties it's open to. Um, this program is probably in 15 or 16 years old, I believe. I'm probably, uh, probably have that a little off, but I believe it's about 15 years old. Um, actually, no, 2008, sorry, 2008 is when it started. So, um, great program if you're uh, thinking of something that's local and uh, you need assistance with, you know, a practice or something like that. Um, and then the National Health Service Corps, which is uh, another great program. This is really geared towards our primary care folks. Um, they actually have uh, three different programs. Uh, they have the, the scholarship program uh, that you can enter in, in any year. So, you know, entering a uh, first year student to a fourth year student can get uh, money from the scholarship program. And that scholarship program also has a uh, stipend built into. Um, and then they have their uh, students to service which is a program that uh, our fourth year students who match in primary care uh, residencies get $120,000 towards paying off their student loans and, and getting about four installments, I think, something like that. So once you match, I think shortly after they send your first installment. Um, and that's the applications for those usually come out, I think, in, in the fall, October, something like that. Uh, it's a great program. And then their traditional loan repay program where uh, as an attending, uh, working in a certain uh, HIPSA score area, you can get um, assistance with loan repayment uh, through the National Health Service Corps. Uh, they've been around a long time and they're well-funded. So uh, this is something that I would definitely try to dip into because the chances of being approved are quite high, uh, quite honestly. And the VA, the VA started a program recently. Um, it's a loan repayment program and it's for recent grads uh, who are enrolled or matched in residency programs identified as a shortage area by the VA. Um, they pay $40,000 a year, maximum is 160. Uh, in return, you have to work for the VA uh, 12 months for every $40,000 they give you, right? So um, another opportunity um, to, to get your loans uh, paid off or, or, assist, or assistance with. So we're now at the conclusion. Uh, so the, the things that I, I really want you to take away, uh, this is, this like anything else, you really need to strategize about and really think about what my long-term uh, financial goals are and how does this particular repayment plan, how does this forgiveness plan fit into that? It shouldn't be the other way around, right? Um, and it's important that when you're making decisions around which repayment plan you're picking, you're taking into consideration whether or not you're thinking forgiveness or not forgiveness. And if if you're not doing forgiveness, that you're picking the repay program because that's that gives you the, the benefits that would help you uh, most. If you are thinking forgiveness, then pays your end probably is a better option for you. Should I do refinancing? Um, and if if you do have questions around that, uh, there are resources out there. Um, if you're the financial aid office that you've been working with. Uh, nine times out of 10, if you send them an email after you graduated, this is kind of troubling me. Can you help me? They're, they're there to help. I know I'm definitely a, a person for our students. If, if they have questions around this, um, if they need clarity. Uh, we're definitely here to help. Um, so making sure that the repayment plan you're picking and the strategy you're using is, is, is going to work for you long term. Um, understanding your loans and the type of interest rates you have and the type of loans you have. Uh, very, very important. And then trying to find the best forgiveness program that works for you, because PSLF does not work for everyone. It just doesn't, right? Um, if it's not in your, your, your goals, if it's not part of, you know, your why, working academic medicine, don't try to force yourself into it so you can qualify for this forgiveness. Um, it may be something else that you can do. Indian Health Service is another organization that I didn't uh, include here, but they do have a, a forgiveness program as well. So there, there are a few different things out there that you can qualify for and look to if, if you need help with paying off student debt uh, that are outside of PSLF. Um, as I mentioned, resources, resources, the AAMC is a fantastic resource. Um, their first team and their first website, uh, anything that you need about financial literacy, about personal finance, about student loans, things like that, uh, that's the first place I would go. Um, if I was a med student or, or an early resident, quite honestly. And then also, as I mentioned before, your financial aid office, if you do have 
um, if you're graduated or if you're you know about to graduate, that's that's a great place to go to get information. Um, the folks in this industry are are um, wonderful and are you know excited about helping the students and making sure that they're uh, they have the tools that they need to make better financial decisions. So I'm going to stop there because I've been talking too long um, and open it up for questions if there are questions and or if if, if someone needs clarity on something, uh, please let me know. Um, hi, good afternoon. Um, I was wondering if you could please clarify why with the repay program, it may not be good for someone who's interested in loan forgiveness. Would you be able to apply for repay and also PSLF? Definitely. And, and uh, if that came across as that you wouldn't be able to do it, I apologize. You definitely would. Um, but you won't maximize the forgiveness if you're in repay. Right. So and that's really around the, the monthly payment cap. So if you're in repay, you don't have that cap. And as you earn more money, your monthly payments are going to be reevaluated every year. So your payments will go up. Um, if you're in if you're in pays you earn, you have a cap, and you know from the very beginning the most you'll ever be required to pay. Uh, and I mean, it's, this is sounds outlandish, but as I mentioned, you can be making a million dollars a year if you're in pays you earn. You would only be required to pay whatever that cap was. If it's twenty one hundred, if it's eighteen hundred, if it's you know, so. You can do both and do PSLF, but as far as the yield pays you earn would give you the, the highest yield. I hope that Thank is. you. Hi, I um, had a quick question um, about the PSLF, because I know that you said that you can work 30 hours a week, like in different hospitals. Would those be like underserved, like communities, like hospitals or like would also like Doctors Without Borders, would that also be like considered in PSLF? Yeah, so any any 501c3, so any teaching hospital um, work does not have to be in an underserved area. It can be any any university affiliated hospital is gonna work. And as you mentioned, Doctors Without Borders, that's another four, 501c3, so that would work. Um, the VA is a, is a 501c3, NIH. Um, there are a lot of nonprofits out here that um, you could work as long as you're being paid by that nonprofit, it it works. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Uh, I see a question in the chat, so I'm just going to read it out loud in case somebody can't unmute. It says, "So for pay, your monthly payment is forever based on your PGY one salary, or do they determine a new monthly payment every year?" Thank you. They do. do oh. They do determine a new monthly payment every year based on your new salary, right? But the monthly payment cap comes into play. So when you graduate, you graduate, let's say, with $200,000 worth of debt, whatever the standard payment would have been, if you decide to pay standard from day one, let's just say it's $2,100. If you enroll and pay, that's the most you'll ever be required to pay, right? But your monthly payments will be evaluated based on your income annually. And I apologize if, if that's that wasn't clear. That your monthly payments will be um, based on your prior year tax information, and that's going to be evaluated annually. When you get to a point where you don't have a partial financial hardship anymore, so you're not qualifying for the lower payments, that's really going to come into play probably, let's say, second year of attending salary. Right? That's when that monthly payment cap kicks in. And no matter how much money you make, that's the most you'll ever be required to pay, right? So you, you're an attending, you're making $300,000. It's no longer be paid if you're in pay. It wouldn't be based on that salary anymore. It's going to be capped at that $1,800 or $1,600 or $2,100. Um, and that's the difference between pay and repay, is repay would not have that cap. So your salary is going to be evaluated every year and your payments are going to be evaluated every year. It's a great question, and I apologize that it wasn't clear. Hi, good evening again. I have another question. So I'm entering into, I'm um, going into pediatrics, 
And so in general, I'm expecting to be making a lower amount in comparison to my other colleagues who may be going into more competitive fields. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, in your opinion, would it be more beneficial to consider, like in terms of comparing repay and pay, especially since repay has that 50% um, subsidy on interest, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not expecting a super lucrative salary, would it still be beneficial for me to consider repay, especially considering that at this moment I'm single, um, I don't have to worry about spousal income um, in comparison to pay. So um, what I would say of that, I think, so the other little piece of information, if Repay 2.0 comes out in, in July, uh, I think it's a slam dunk for you. If that happens, then the benefits they're talking about come out. Um, but I would start out in pay. And the reason I, I would say start out in pay, um, if Repay 2.0 comes out, the the idea is or the word is it would get rid of all the other income driven repayment plans. So pay as you earn would not be an option for new um, entry if Repay 2.0 comes out and they you know uh, make those changes. So if you start out in pay and if you're getting if you're doing your consolidation and you're enrolling in your repayment plan now, you start out in pay, then you have that option going forward as well. And you can always switch into repay or repay 2.0 later on if you want to. But if you start out in repay or repay 2.0, you will not be able to switch into pay because it won't be an option, right? So I would start out in pay and then see where things are going. Am I gonna, do I have enough loan debt to, to, for, to, for it to make sense as far as uh, PSLF is concerned? Um, is private practice an option? Am I actually gonna be finished paying this off in eight years? If those if those things are, you know, depends on the answer to those things, either you stay in pay or you go to repay 2.0, because that 100% subsidy is a fantastic benefit. Um, and so I wouldn't even I wouldn't even touch repay in the very beginning. I would enroll in pay when July comes out if repay 2.0 comes out. I go ahead and switch to that, depending on how you know I answer those questions. Um, but it really should be between pay and repay 2.0. Thank you so much. I have one quick question. For PSLF, if you work for a qualified employer for say five years and you're making payments those five years, mm -hmm. um, and then for some reason you change employers to another qualified employer, do those payments for those first five years still go towards those, um, the 10 year payment before you achieve forgiveness or does it reset when you change employers? No, it, it goes towards. So those things can be combined, definitely. Yeah, as long as that second employer is a qualified employer as well. Yeah. So that's when you would have to, and when I said you don't have to do the form annually, but you do have to do it when you switch employers, right? So you would have two separate forms for those employers, but yes, it would count. Great. Thank you. Sure. Just building off of Nyla's point, because I think you made this earlier, but I want to clarify, if you say you're a resident, so you're working for a qualified employer for five years, then you go into private practice for two years, and then you join an academic medical center that is a qualified employer, would all of those payments work as long as you were working for the qualified employer? Correct. So the time that you were with the private practice, those would not count, but the other yeah, sets of payments would count. Okay. There's also another question in the chat. It says, do you recommend we file taxes every year as a medical student, even if it is zero? Also, should we file taxes our fourth year? I recommend filing taxes your fourth year for sure. The other years you can file or not. It, it just depends on, um, I mean, if it's something that you do, then you should. But I think the fourth year is important because that's going to be used to determine what your payments are going to be in their repayment plans. Um, but the other years, uh, there's no real benefit, but you can definitely do it. But I would, the fourth year, yes, I would suggest you do it. The other thing about private practice, so I do want to mention this. Private practice alone does not make you ineligible for PSLF. 
if you're able to do private practice and then 30 hours a week at a nonprofit, you can still get PSLF, right? Now your work-life balance would be terrible. Um, and there's some specialties that can probably do this and others that can't for sure, but you can do both. Um, and if you're doing 30 hours a week in nonprofit, you're, you're good to go. So that's just something to keep in mind. I was just going to build off something I've heard from a couple of students. Um, there is some concern that the PSLF program is unpopular, particularly with the Republicans uh, in Congress. What are the chances that the program will exist 10 years from now for those of uh, those students who are entering residency right now? Right, right. I wish I wish I can give like 100 percent certainty and, and say this is definitely going to happen. And um, but I'm I'm fairly certain it's going to be around, and I, I think there's a couple couple of reasons why. Number one, uh, the promissory note that you sign says that you're eligible for this program. So um, for them to really get rid of it, you have to get everyone to sign a new promissory note, create a new student loan program, basically. Um, also, politically, this is a this program is is not as um, hmm, how do I put this? So I think it helps both both sides, quite honestly, because um, everybody's benefiting from this. It's not you know one uh, one faction, one one you know type of you know person. Or I think everyone benefits. So for them to decide that we're gonna get rid of this. Um, there probably be lots of class action lawsuits, one, but also two, they may not, the, the folks that they're affecting are folks who are, who are voting them in. Uh, they probably won't be in Washington the next next time around. So I, I think um, this to go away is, is going to be very, very hard. Um, I, I think the White House has tried to, the best way it can, uh, kind of put it in, in bubble wrap by creating Repay 2.0 getting rid of pays you earn and the monthly payment cap so that high potential earners are not getting the huge forgiveness that they've been qualifying for. So that could be that could be something that folks could really have issue with, right? Why are doctors making six hundred thousand dollars getting four hundred thousand dollars forgiven? Because the way it's set up is that the longer you're in training, the lower your payments are going to be for a long period of time, the higher the forgiveness you're going to have. And generally, the longer you're training, the higher your income potential is. So that's, you know, and you're working a nonprofit the entire time. So there, there, there are situations where people are making quite a bit of money and they're getting a lot of it for a lot of their student loans forgiven. Um, that that I think would be unpopular. But with the Repay 2.0, getting rid of that type of thing where um, you're making very low payments, even though your, your income is very high. Um, I think that kind of solves it a little bit, but I don't believe this program will be going away. Uh, and especially for, for folks who are getting into it now. Um, people who are in like the first year of, of college, they may be, uh, you know, the ones that, that have to suffer that. Um, but I, I don't really believe uh, folks who are getting into residency now or next year or a year after that, you have to worry about uh, the program going away. Um, I just think grandfathering is gonna be part of it, even if they change it. Folks who got this promise you know, saying that they're eligible will be grandfathered through. Um, and it's I, it's gotten more popular the last few years, I think on both sides of the aisle. So um, I, just, I don't see it happening, but you know, this world is, is crazy, it's crazy. Um, I, I know that didn't give you a lot of confidence, but I, I don't really believe it's going to go anywhere. Hi, I had um, another quick question. I think I just wasn't really understanding, like with the repay, the protected salary um, that increases to 225% right. of the poverty line. I'm sorry, could you explain that one more time? So currently, when they're uh, calculating your payment, it's you know 10 or 15 percent of discretionary income so they have to figure out what discretionary income is right so when they determine that discretionary income they're looking at your salary 
and then it's a there you're able to um, protect 150 percent of that whatever what 150 percent of the property line so we say nineteen thousand dollars is the property line and then you put you know fifty thousand dollars on top of that excuse me uh, ten thousand dollars on top of that so now we're at around thirty thousand dollars of protected income for each person who's a single person um, when they're determining their payment so you take your annual salary subtract that 30 because that's protected now you're left with let's say it's 60 now you're left with thirty thousand dollars that they can assess your payments on right and then if it's ten percent of that right so we have three thousand dollars and then you divide that three thousand by 12 and that gives you what your monthly payments will be so each year provided your family size doesn't change that's honest if you're a single person that's how the calculations will be done now with repay 2.0 it's 225 percent of that so now that's closer to forty thousand dollars or a little bit more than forty thousand dollars versus the thirty thousand or something it was before right so now you have even more protected income so now you have a chance of two years worth of zero payment versus just one year um and maybe even three years in some situations of, of zero payment right because now you have 42 odd some odd dollars that's protected against being considered for your uh, for your payment does that make sense yes thank you sure there's another question put in the chat uh the student asks does the 30 hour minimum for PSLF have to be clinical medicine or can it someone do both clinical and academic medicine as long as it is within a 501c3 nonprofit organization? All right. There, so there are no stipulations around what you're doing. It's just as long as you're working 30 hours a week for a nonprofit and getting paid by that nonprofit. Right. So you could be teaching or you could be seeing patients or you could be doing what I do. And that all qualifies. Right. So there is no, you know, as far as requirements, as far as what your job title should be or what your function should be, it's just as long as you're working for that 501c3 and getting paid. So, and I'm glad this came up because now, for example, we have like emergency med docs who often are working in these 501c3 settings, but they're working for a private group, right? So the private group is paying them within that 501c3 setting that work does not count because it's a private group paying them if the hospital itself was paying them that 501c3 that's, that's fine but if the private group is paying them to do that work there then they're, that's not going to count as, as as qualifying work so when you're looking at your contract when you're you know figuring out where you're going to go to work for a residency or for for fellowship or for attending use it's important that you kind of understand how that kind of works um, so that you're getting paid by the right entity if you're trying to get the forgiveness. All right. Um, if there are no more questions, thank you, Damien, for a wonderful presentation, and thank you to the participants for attending this webinar. The resources and slides that were shared in this presentation will be shared with the attendees in the next few days. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar with details to come soon. Good night, everyone. Thank you.